And good evening. Firing back, we begin top story tonight with a dramatic escalation in the war in Ukraine. Did Zelensky's military just take its boldest action yet against Russia? Surveillance video, take a look, appearing to show the moments, a series of missile strikes from helicopters on a Russian oil depot just 20 miles from the border. The strike marking the first attack on Russian soil since the start of this war. The facility going up in flames, massive plumes of smoke filling the skies. A senior U.S. official, defense official telling NBC News tonight Ukraine is behind the attack. But Ukraine has neither confirmed nor denied its involvement. Russia taking a hit at that depot but not letting up on its own assault. The heavily damaged city of Mariupol again coming under fire. The Red Cross forced to abandon its efforts to evacuate civilians from there today. And Kharkiv in the east hit hard despite Russian promises to let up on that part of the country. Richard Engel is there and leads us off again tonight. Russian officials say Ukraine took the war to Russia, launching a cross-border attack with two combat helicopters. This video appears to show their tracer rounds, destroying a fuel depot 20 miles from the Ukrainian border. A senior U.S. defense official tells NBC News that Ukraine was responsible for the daring raid, Ukraine's first of the war. But Ukraine's official response seemed deliberately ambiguous, with defense officials saying they couldn't confirm or deny involvement. The Kremlin tonight criticizing the strike on the Russian facility, saying it could harm ongoing peace talks. But the attack pales in comparison to what Russia has done just 45 miles away across the border in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, where Russian artillery and rockets have destroyed hundreds of buildings and, as we saw today, flattened nearby towns. In some areas, not leaving a single home standing. At the hospital in Chehuyiv, Yevheni, a farm worker, was taking a break with a friend when he heard that dreaded whistle and a Russian bomb exploded next to him. His friend was killed. Down the hall, Elena, 20 years old, who works the register at a supermarket, was shot when Russian troops opened fire on a bus full of civilian passengers. She says eight people were killed and that the Russians went through their pockets and bags and stole their money. Across Chehuyev, Ukrainian troops were picking up the pieces of Russian bombs that are now all over town. But today it was Ukraine that sent a message to Russia that it too can reach across the border. Tom, it's likely that Russia will respond militarily and we're already hearing attacks here in this city. But the Kremlin's public response has been somewhat muted because this is embarrassing for Russia that Ukrainian helicopters were able to take off from this country, fly low over the border, penetrate 20 miles into Russian airspace, carry on an attack and return without being shot down. It shows a different kind of Ukrainian capability. Tom? Definitely a new phase in this war. Richard Engel for us tonight. Richard, thank you. For more on that reported Ukraine strike on Russia, I want to bring in Holden Triplett. He's, a, he's the former director of counterintelligence at the uh, National Security Council and founder of Trenchcoat Advisors. Holden, thank you for joining Top Story tonight. You were also the FBI's number two intelligence official in Moscow for several years. You have the Russians blaming Ukraine and U.S. intelligence seeming to confirm that. Why do you think the Ukrainians have not taken credit for this yet? Well, they're in the midst of a negotiation with the Russians, obviously, and, and anything like this would look like a, a essentially an escalation. And so I think they want to not be seen as someone um, who is derailing uh, the supposed you know, ceasefire talks. Um, so they want to distance themselves from this um, attack if, if they're the ones who did carry it out. We know that the, the capabilities of the Ukrainian military at first could not match the Russian superpower. Obviously, what's happened on the battlefield has changed a lot of perceptions here. We know the Ukrainian military probably can't extend too far into Russia. What kind of sign or what kind of message do you think they were trying to send with this attack? Well, if they were the ones responsible for this, I think they want to just show the Russians that they can't hit infrastructure and they can't hit infrastructure that is important to the Russians. It's a, a fuel depot, um, one that is likely being used um, as the Russians are regrouping and reorganizing and refueling a lot of um, the equipment that they're using as part of the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so again, if they are responsible, ultimately, if that's bound or they take responsibility for it, they likely wanted to hurt them um, at, at part of their infrastructure, the basic uh, support network they have to continue the war. 
What do you think Putin does with this attack and, and, and the reported pictures coming out? I think he uses this. Um, you know, it, it's a great way to for his own um, yeah, domestic audience uh, who generally support him, but to shore up that support uh, to show that, look, there are attacks on Russian soil, um, you know, that, that they are hurting uh, you, you know, Russian assets. Um, and so I think he's going to play this up. Um, but as, as you've said, there is a difficulty with this because this shows a little bit of failure on their part. They didn't anticipate the attack. They couldn't stop it. Um, and so they've got to be very careful with how they use this information. Holden Triplett for us tonight. Holden, thank you for joining Top Story. One of the many concerning chapters of this war has been the battle over Chernobyl. This week, the Russians are abruptly abandoning the disaster site as reports emerge of soldiers getting exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has those details. It's the site of one of the world's most terrifying disasters, leaving towns poisoned and abandoned. Now another debacle. Ukrainian authorities say Russian soldiers have left the Chernobyl nuclear power plant after suffering acute radiation sickness. We have seen a spike in radiation. It is very likely due to um, the transport of, of heavy military equipment. So that gives you an, an indication that um, the, these troops um, do do not know what they're doing and behaving recklessly. Employees inside the plant had worked at gunpoint, Ukrainian authorities say, after Russian forces seized control five weeks ago. The agency in charge of the country's nuclear power stations now says the Russian soldiers fled towards Ukraine's border with Belarus, leaving in phases starting Tuesday. It also claims the Russians had dug trenches in the Red Forest, long considered Chernobyl's most polluted area, where thousands of pine trees turned red during the 1986 nuclear disaster. A local mayor says the Russians also took Ukrainian National Guardsmen with them as prisoners. NBC News can't independently verify those claims. The Kremlin has not commented, but earlier this week said it was scaling back military action in the area to focus elsewhere. They clearly didn't bring any specialists with them who have experience with nuclear power plants, with nuclear facilities, with radiation. They had no concern for their own personnel, their own soldiers. Ukrainian authorities say that before Russian soldiers left Chernobyl, they stole computers and even coffee makers from the plant, as well as looted a nearby hotel. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez from Ukraine tonight. Gabe, thank you. We want to come back home, turning now to a very strong day for job growth in the U.S., the unemployment rate dropping to 3.6 percent, an almost 50-year low. But it comes as surging inflation could impact your salaries. NBC's Tom Costello has those details. With the country seemingly on the backside of the pandemic, more evidence the economy is running at full throttle. 431,000 Americans found jobs in March, led by business services, retailers, and manufacturing. The unemployment rate now close to the 50-year low set two years ago. America is our back to work, and that's good news for millions of families who have a little more breathing room. In Boston, Jackie Gannon just graduated with a bachelor's degree in nursing and quickly landed her dream job at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm really looking forward to becoming a great oncology nurse. I love everything I've learned so far, but I feel like there's still so much to learn. But sky-high inflation is erasing bigger paychecks. While hourly earnings are up 5.6% over last year, nearly one in five workers says they run out of money before they get their next check as they struggle with soaring gas and food prices. Meanwhile, with the unemployment rate so low, many employers are still struggling to find workers, a problem for nearly half of all small business owners. In Tennessee, Bach Construction has boosted wages by 20%, but still can't attract young people interested in physical labor and it just doesn't create the cachet and the buzz of what everybody, you know, everybody wants to be in tech or something they see on the news not just you know boring old construction okay that was tom costello now to nbc's investigative series the fleecing of america tonight the alarming growth of fraud cases in healthcare, and particularly around telemedicine the pandemic creating a perfect storm that allowed crooks to target victims with phony consultations over the phone and through video among other schemes tonight how people are being scammed and the men and women who are working around the clock to stop it i got this phone call about cardiac genetic screening they said, this is from Medicare, and uh, 
You, this is very important. That phone call, part of a trap 67-year-old Vicki Bryan says she fell right into. She had my address. And she said, we'll send you a kit. Did it seem professional throughout all the steps? Did it seem very, legit? Very professional. I mean, she had all my information. Brian did a phone consult with someone she believed was a doctor, got a screening kit, and took the test. What she got back? Thousands of dollars in bills for services she says she never needed. I got sucked in. Since the pandemic, telemedicine has exploded. Medicare visits grew by more than 50 million in one year. To make care more accessible, hundreds of rules for Medicaid and Medicare were relaxed. Assistant Attorney General Kenneth Polite says that led to a boom for crooks. Is it almost a perfect storm with a global pandemic and then the rise of telemedicine? It is a perfect storm in a lot of ways. It has made it easier for crooks uh, to identify potential uh, patients, folks that they can take advantage of. It's also made it much more profitable for them. The scams often start with foreign call centers and end with your insurance companies or Medicare getting large bills for unnecessary or bogus services. The call centers are randomly calling people Randomly calling individuals, sometimes not so random. Sometimes there are lists of individuals, a list of potential patients that they're, they're working from. They're trying to encourage them to agree to one particular type of test. The Department of Justice says the alleged losses from criminal health care fraud schemes are in the billions. To catch the crooks, the DOJ expanded its health care fraud strike force, giving NBC News exclusive access to its headquarters. The agents and prosecutors you see in these rooms are working around the clock, not only collecting cyber evidence, but also doing tactical ops, launching takedowns of doctors, lab owners, and money launderers. It is making it harder even to detect. Analysts also pour over data, trying to spot schemes and patterns of billing that don't add up. Prosecutor Lisa Miller oversees the DOJ's unit and says sometimes the crooks even spell it out for investigators on their cell phones. They'll talk about millions with emojis of smiles, the motive for the crime. Um, they'll send, you know, dollar sign symbols, things like that. Photos of themselves in luxury cars. In one case, a former nightclub promoter turned lab owner in South Florida helped orchestrate a $73 million Medicare fraud scheme targeting elderly Americans using a call center and targeted Facebook ads for free cardiac and cancer genetic testing and paying kickbacks to arrange for medical professionals to sign off on the unnecessary testing. In text from March 2020, the goal was clear, quote, Seems like we can milk telemed, end quote. Last year, the strike forces investigations led to more than 200 convictions and charges against 54 medical professionals. And now there are cases in the works for hundreds more. It's the worst we've seen telemedicine fraud currently. Yeah. Telemedicine is a very important technology that provides life-saving care to some people, but unfortunately, it's prone to abuse, and it's a trust-based system. A system that now has Vicki Bryan still trying to get answers, all because of one phone call. It was a violation. They violated me in my own home. They took advantage of me. Some, some healthcare crooks are going to be watching this. Mm -hmm. What's your message to them? You picked on the wrong one. You know, that's, that's my message to them. I want a bunch of folks to come forward, elders, um, anybody who's a beneficiary of Medicaid or Medicare. If it doesn't seem right, report it. New development tonight in the Ghislaine Maxwell case. A federal judge has denied her request for a new trial. You may remember Maxwell's lawyers had called for a, pre a retrial after a juror failed to disclose he was a sexual assault victim. A judge today ruling her legal team failed to meet the requirements for a new trial. Maxwell, the ex-girlfriend, of course, of Jeffrey Epstein, was convicted on federal sex trafficking charges in December. She's now facing decades behind bars. All right, still ahead tonight on Top Story, the bans on transgender athletes going into effect across the country. More than a dozen states signing laws that effectively ban trans athletes. The heated debate over who should be allowed to compete. Plus... The brawl at a Florida hotel, new body cam footage showing how police responded to the incident, why some are now saying they put the wrong man in handcuffs. And the soccer star arrested, Hope Solo, taken into custody in a Walmart parking lot for driving under the influence. The charges she's now facing, and who was in her car? Top story, just getting started.
Next tonight, outrage growing after five states in the last week introduced or passed legislation aimed at banning transgender students from sports. Now advocates vowing to fight these bills say they're violating these athletes' rights. Zinclay Esamwa lays it out now for us. Tonight, as the debate intensifies nationwide, lawmakers are pushing transgender sports bans. I know for some other kids that are also trans, we just want to play. More than a dozen states enacting legislation limiting transgender students' participation in school sports, with at least five states in the last week alone making significant progress or passing laws regarding transgender athletes. When suicide rates and attempts for children in Oklahoma go up because of legislation like this that says we don't want to see you. These measures would block transgender students from competing on sports teams that align with their gender identity. Some claiming transgender athletes, particularly transgender girls, have an unfair advantage in sports. I'd like to reiterate the principle of this bill. Women deserve the same opportunity as men to develop their talents and strive for excellence. But trans athletes and their advocates say the bills are transphobic, ostracizing athletes and stripping them of their rights. I really don't want this bill to pass because that means I can't play and it will be extremely detrimental to my mental health as well. Tensions now mounting with nearly 670 anti-LGBTQ plus bills filed in state houses since 2018. According to a recent Gallup poll, 62% of respondents share that sentiment, believing athletes should only play on sports teams that match the gender they were assigned at birth. But polling is conflicting, with two-thirds of Americans against laws that would limit transgender rights. Republican Utah Governor Spencer Cox vetoing a trans sports ban bill in March, writing that the bill harms, quote, four kids who are just trying to find some friends and feel like they are part of something. But the state's legislature just days later overriding that veto. This after collegiate swimmer Leah Thomas became the first transgender athlete to win an NCAA championship despite protests against her participation. I try to ignore it as much as I can. I try to focus on my swimming. Oklahoma's governor seemingly referencing Thomas as he signed a transgender sports ban into law Wednesday. We all saw the imagery with the pin, uh, pin swimmer, and uh, we, we don't want that to happen. We're making that stand today in the state of Oklahoma. Advocates now ready to take the fight to the courtroom so transgender athletes can take the field. We uh, truly believe that these are uncon unconstitutional. We think we have Supreme Court um, case law on our side. All right, Zinclay joins us now live in studio. Let's pick up right there. So we, we heard it there. These advocates want to take this to court. Is there any precedent yet? Because this is sort of new. Yeah, Tom. So these bans are bound to face legal opposition. In some cases, they have specifically West Virginia. The ACLU actually filed a lawsuit against a trans athlete ban, and a judge met their demands and said there is a temporary hold. Now, there will be a follow-up hearing this summer. But it's worth noting, Tom, that the trans athlete at the center of that West Virginia case is just 11 years old. Her 11 name, years old. 11. Her name is Becky Pepper Jackson, and the ACLU says while she's still been able to play, there still seems to be an undercurrent of anti-trans sentiments around the state and country. So it's a case to continue to watch. I Tom. think a lot of people are going to be watching to see what happens with that court case. All right, Sinclair, great story. Thank you for that. Next tonight, to growing outrage over an arrest at a hotel in Florida. A black hotel clerk taken into custody after he called for help following a brawl and new police body cam footage appears to show discrepancies between what police reported and what actually happened. NBC's Issa Gutierrez has that story. Tonight, police body camera video reveals a shocking new angle of a hotel brawl in Florida. The video, released by the Fort Lauderdale Police Department, shows officers yelling and pushing a black hotel employee before arresting him, even though that employee, Raymond Rashal, was the one to call the police in the first place. Previously released surveillance footage of the incident at a Best Western shows 28-year-old Rashal working at the lobby desk when a man charges past the front desk barrier towards him. Rashal punches the man, Jason Rabe, multiple times before putting him in a headlock and holds him down while 911 was called. According to the incident report from the police, Rashal said the man refused to leave the hotel. Rashal told CBS's Miami affiliate that he canceled Rabe's stay because Rabe, who is white, was making racial slurs towards him. We reached out to Rashal for comment but have not heard back. 
In the incident report obtained by NBC News, when police responded to the scene, Rashal was hostile and refused to back up. The officer reporting he pushed Rashal back before Rashal, quote, placed his hands on my upper torso and pushed me. It does not appear Rashal pushed the officer from the footage reviewed by NBC News. And you didn't help nothing. Wait, wait, back up, back up. Rashal was taken into custody and charged with disorderly conduct and resisting an officer with violence. The charges were later dropped. The incident report also states the guest, Jason Rabe of New York, was, quote, obviously drunk, uneasy on his feet, and slurring his words, but calm and tried to explain that Rashal had canceled his reservation. Surveillance video shows police escorting Rabe out of the hotel. The incident report saying he was cited for trespassing before getting a courtesy ride to a friend's house, according to the report. How is it that the clerk got arrested, uh, but the subject in this whole thing uh, gets to have a ride home. And those are legitimate questions. On a phone call, Rabe told us what started the incident was, quote, just a lack of customer service, and he was very rude. You know, so that led to some other stuff, adding that he's, quote, literally the most non-racist person. The videos of the incident circulating and sparking outrage online, with people accusing police of racial bias against Rashal. In a statement, the Fort Lauderdale Police Department said it's conducting a review of the incident. All right, Issa joins us now from the studio. And just to remind our viewers, how did this whole thing actually start? We don't actually know, Tom. So the incident report, uh, police say that there were no independent witnesses who could corroborate how the physical altercation that we watched play out in the video actually began. Both parties say that the other person started it, right? Uh, police today told us that they couldn't give us more information on that internal investigation that they're conducting or on the officers involved. The guest, it, it says in the police report, was appeared drunk and is there any evidence that that guest also used racial slurs? Uh, the incident report, just to clarify, said that he was obviously drunk. Obviously That's drunk. How, okay. how police um, right. described it. At this point, we don't have that evidence, um, and it wasn't mentioned uh, in the incident report either. Will there be an independent investigation? Because when you look at the video and the body cam, there's some stuff that, that obviously doesn't add up. There are people who are very upset online calling for that. Uh, the law enforcement expert that I spoke to also said that that is warranted in this case, right? An investigation uh, that's independent outside of just that investigation that the police department is doing internally. Remember, Tom, this happened back in January, and these videos are just now circulating in the last week, causing all this outrage. Now is when we're talking about it. So in these cases, when they draw so much national attention, uh, that's when law enforcement experts like the one that I talked to really say, OK, maybe this should be an investigation that should be done outside of the police. OK, Issa Gutierrez, we thank you for that. We know you'll stay on top of it. When we come back, the fires raging in Florida. Thousands of acres burned in Miami, the smoke creating dangerous driving conditions. Why experts fear the blaze could get much bigger. We'll explain. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with soccer star Hope Solo, arrested in North Carolina for DWI while she was with her young children. Police say she was taken into custody in a Walmart parking lot in Winston-Salem and that her two-year-old twins were in the car at the time. The former Team USA goalie is charged with DWI, resisting arrest and misdemeanor child abuse. A representative for Solo saying in a statement she plans to defend the charges. All right, now to the wildfires raging outside of Miami. A brush fire scorching thousands of acres so far. Experts warning it could grow to 20,000 acres as strong winds and dry conditions fuel those flames. The fire is burning in a conservation area, so no homes are threatened. However, thick smoke from the fire could cause hazardous driving conditions. So far, no injuries have been reported. A consumer alert tonight, GM recalling nearly 682,000 vehicles over faulty windshield wipers. The recall covers the Chevrolet Equinox and the GMC Terrain from the 2014 and 2015 model years. Affected owners will be notified next month and repairs will be made for free. And basketball fans gearing up for the historic March Madness game this weekend. Rivals Duke and the University of North Carolina gearing up for their first Final Four meeting. It will also be the 100th time the two meet during the career of legendary Duke Head coach, Coach K, who will retire after the season after more than 40 years. A lot of people are going to be watching that game. Switching gears now, and we continue our coverage from Ukraine with more than 4 million people now having fled the war-torn country. We are starting to see what life is like for displaced people living in this new normal. 
Dasha Burns now in Poland sharing the story of refugees trying to find their way. This has long been a city of survival. Krakow, Poland's storied architecture was spared the Nazis' bombs in World War II. Now it's a city full of survivors, refugees fleeing today's war. I think that my life just stopped at the moment the war started. Irina Bavlucek was a corporate attorney in Lviv. Now in Krakow, her days are spent with laundry, online homework, and waiting inside this Catholic seminary where she's living with her two kids. How does it feel to have your life change so dramatically, so quickly? Do you just start to realize that the most important thing is safety? Like nearly everyone we've met, her goal is to go home to Ukraine rather than grow roots here in Poland. But down the hall, Lubov Sedanich's family has had to settle in a bit more. The war interrupted her mother's cancer treatment. In Poland, she's able to get care again. We are praying for her health, Lubov says, and for our family left behind in Ukraine. For Lubov's kids, school now means Polish PE classes, new friends, and a new language. Both families know that what comes next is finding a job and a more permanent home. I should uh, start looking for a job just to feed my kids and myself. Uh, I don't know. You're not ready to build a life outside of Ukraine. Uh, we are not ready because we left all our life uh, there in Ukraine. Starting a new life here, making the loss of home all the more final. Dasha Burns, NBC News, Krakow, Poland. Dasha Burns for us. Back here at home, workers at Amazon Warehouse in Staten Island celebrating today after voting to unionize. This will be the first union at the tech giant's U.S. facilities after a failed attempt last year in Alabama. It has the chance to upend the business model at this gigantic company. Our Antonia Hilton has her reactions. A historic vote in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. Workers at an Amazon warehouse in Staten Island will unionize, a first in the U.S. in Amazon's 27 years. Today, we make history. Of the 4,800 ballots, more than 2,600 were in favor of joining the Amazon Labor Union, formed by current and former employees led by Christian Smalls. Ooh, this movement, um, this is the catalyst of a revolution. The company fired Smalls in 2020, citing safety issues after he helped organize a walkout over what he says were insufficient COVID precautions. What does this moment mean for you? Um, this moment means everything. It's, uh, this is justice for me and uh, these workers. Said that it's impossible, you know, but the odds are too big. Um, and they all should definitely uh, take a, a good look at what we did. Amazon said it was disappointed with the outcome of the election in Staten Island, adding, we believe having a direct relationship with the company is best for our employees. Last year, the vote to unionize at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama failed, but a redo was ordered, and the results, which are being counted this week, are still unclear. The pandemic fueled a labor movement at many big chains, with workers demanding more rights, stricter safety protocols, and better benefits. I think we're going to see more and more union activity um, across the country. Workers do have the upper hand right now in demanding more from corporate America. All right, Antonia Hilton joins us tonight from a windy Staten Island. Antonia, Amazon has tried to prevent its workers from unionizing, but they're facing another vote later this week. That's exactly right, Tom. Amazon has spent about $4.3 million trying to prevent today's result, aggressively fighting these unionization efforts. But now they're facing yet another vote on April 25th at a warehouse that's not far from where I am right now. Antonia Hilton for us tonight. Antonia, thank you. Now to Money Talks. A look at what consumers need to know from the business world and beyond. Tonight, a high-tech upgrade in the fast food industry that could change your drive through experience. A new company rolling out technology that lets fast food workers take your drive through order from anywhere in the world, offering the comforts of remote work for the first time to many food service workers who spent the bulk of the pandemic on the front lines. NBC senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn got an exclusive look at the new technology. The next time you roll up to a drive through take a closer look. The person taking your order may not even be on site. Would you like some banana pudding to go with that? Uh, sure, I'll take a uh, four ounce. Becky saves time and gas, skipping a 30-minute commute, working part-time when she's not babysitting her grandkids. I love the job. 
I love meeting new people every day, the social interaction, and I get to work from home. She's using Bite Ninja, video software that allows restaurants to hire workers from and anywhere with an internet connection side. to take orders right. remotely. Thank you, have a great day. So we're gonna give it a try with me taking orders here in New York for customers at this drive-thru in Tennessee. That's right, I'm gonna work the drive-thru at Baby Jack's, a popular barbecue chain near Memphis. But first, I have to study the menu and pass an online test. How many different barbecue sauces does Baby Jack serve? Easy, eight. What do I say to greet the customers? Hi, welcome to Baby Jack's. I'm Vicki. What can I get started for you today? Next, a little practice with my Bite Ninja trainer, Anna Marie. Your total is gonna be 1917. Sounds good. Time for me to take a real order. Hi, welcome to Baby Jack's. My yeah. name is Vicki. Can I take your order, please? Sure, um, I'd like a baked potato with a um, brisket. Okay, give me just one second, I'm sorry. I am very new to the job. But I quickly get up to speed and it's fun. So you have the loaded barbecue potato with butter, sour cream, bacon bits, shredded cheese, barbecue sauce, chives, beef brisket with a sweet mild sauce and a Diet Coke and banana pudding as your side. Yep. Thank you so much. Then the kitchen gets cooking, and just like at a regular drive-thru, an employee hands the customer their order. There you go. One after another. Hi there, welcome to Baby Jack. The customers lined up in Tennessee. And what kind of sauce did you want on that? Most had no idea I was more than a thousand miles away. Pull up at the next window and we'll get you taken care of. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. It's no secret that restaurants are struggling to hire. Baby Jack's owner, Will Clem, developed Bite Ninja after he couldn't staff his own drive through during the pandemic. One night, he set up his laptop and took orders from home using Zoom. This was really a solution for our restaurants. It helped us so much that we said, man, uh, this is something that we think is going to help a lot of restaurant owners nationwide. So far, 12 restaurant chains in six states rely on a pool of 4,100 so-called ninjas who make 10 to $20 an hour, depending on demand. And it's not the only new tech that could be coming to an eatery near you. One restaurant in Dallas is using robot waiters. Hamburger chain White Castle recently announced plans to install automated French fry chefs at 100 restaurants. And no need to tip this bartender serving up drinks at the Winter Olympics. How is it? It's, um, it's a screwdriver. Okay. It's all right. It all comes just in time. According to a recent survey, about 50% of restaurant operators cite staffing recruitment and retention as the top challenge of 2022. But with the challenges of today come the solutions of tomorrow. And you just never know who might be taking your next drive through order. Yeah, I'm, I'm low key freaking out right now. Why are you low key freaking out? Because I definitely know who you are. You do? Uh, yeah. First. Do you watch the Today Show? Every day. Well, it is a pleasure to meet you. We're doing a story about this technology. What do you think? Yeah, it's awesome. I didn't expect to see someone on the screen. I definitely didn't expect to see Vicky on my screen. All right, Vicky joins us now from New York. First off, Vicky, great report. It seems like you had a lot of fun with this new technology. What about the restaurants themselves? How much are they actually paying to use this service? We had a blast, Tom. And Bite Ninja tells us on average it costs about $500 for a restaurant to start up with the software, the service. And then Bite Ninja takes a little bit of a profit off of the hourly fee as well. But they say overall restaurants do save because it's cheaper to hire someone just for the dinner or the lunch rush than hiring someone for the full day. And on the employee side, it's nice if you want flexibility and you just want to work a couple hours a day. Yeah, and on that point, it looks like it opens up so much opportunity for service workers to get some of those benefits of remote work. How accessible are these jobs? What does the training look like? And remind our viewers again around where the pay scale is. Well, I'll say this, it was 10 to $20 per hour, depending on what region of the country you live in. And if I can do it, I think anybody can do it. It took me a little bit, about half a day, you gotta go through the online course and kind of practice, you take those quizzes. Depending on the restaurant menu, and maybe if you've had restaurant experience before, you could probably get it down in a day or two. You're gonna do some of that video training, obviously, in real life with the trainer overlooking you. But I will say, we originally started with a Mexican food restaurant menu, and holy smokes, there were so many combinations nations, Tom. I was really grateful when we ended up switching to the barbecue menu. I'll just tell you that. I have a lot of um, sympathy for all those people who take my orders and you're like, can yeah. I have this on the side and hold that and extra this? 
now you really appreciate the people who do it so fast. Oh my gosh, it is, it is a real talent. You look like you were incredible, but also look like a lot of fun. Vicky, thank you as always for joining Top Story tonight on this Friday. We appreciate it. And coming up, caravan clashes, hundreds of migrants charging at riot officers in Mexico, at one point even using a cross to break through a barrier. Where they're headed, next. We are back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the deadly mine accident in Serbia. Officials saying a shaft collapsed at the site, causing a release of methane gas. Eight people killed and 18 others injured. Officials say proper security measures were in place, but the collapse is now under investigation. And hundreds of migrants clashing with police in Mexico as they head to the U.S. border. This new video shows the group of nearly 500 people, many from Venezuela, charging at riot officers using a wooden cross at what point to break through a police line. Officers responding with batons and pepper spray. It happened near the Mexico-Guatemala border as the group tries to reach the U.S. after the Biden administration announced it would end COVID policy, a COVID policy that turned away asylum seekers. And Australia now cleaning up after massive flooding along the country's east coast. The area hit with another round of intense flooding this week. At least three people so far have been killed. Rains are now letting up, allowing some residents to return home and assess the damage. A string of flooding in Australia since February has displaced tens of thousands of residents and left at least 20 people dead. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.